But we're going to continue with our, our series called Promises, and we're going to continue with the story of Abraham. Uh, we've, we've looked at several stories of how God has made these promises throughout Scripture. And last week we looked at Abraham and the promises that God made to Abraham and what those promises even mean for us today. And so we're going to continue with Abraham a little bit, and, and hopefully we can relate to Abraham some as we look at what he does not too long after he receives the promises of God. You know, one of the biggest flaws, I think, with human beings is short-term memory loss. Anybody deal with short-term memory loss? Yeah, like, like every day, you know? You know what was that? Yeah, right. You know, when you, you know, you walk into from one room to the next and immediately forget <clears throat> why are you even in here, you know? can't tell you how many times I do that. I walk in and go, why did I come in here? I have no idea. Why. Like I was, I was out with Caitlin yesterday and we went to, uh, went to a record place and then I, was, I needed to go to Target because there was like only three things I needed from Target. I could not remember why I needed to go to Target. As I'm driving there, I'm like, I guess I'm going home because I have no idea why I need to go to Target. And as soon as I get home, I'm doing something else and I'm like, oh, yep, that's why I needed to go to Target. I was like, Hey, let's get back in the car. We gotta go back. I gotta go to Target. Let <laughs> me get some things. But that short-term memory loss just drives you crazy, doesn't it? Short-term memory loss is, is nothing new to humanity. In fact, I think short-term memory loss is something that plagued God's people all throughout Scripture. You know, they were quick to forget what God had done for them. That's why God would always remind them, remember what I did for you. Remember what I did for you. Remember we started this series looking at the Exodus and the promise that God made to them in the Exodus and delivering them out of slavery. And all throughout scripture, he kept telling them, remember, I am the God who delivered you out of slavery because they had a tendency to forget. But God never forgot. God was always faithful to the promises that he made. And when it comes to Abraham, Abraham was no exception to this short-term memory loss issue. Abraham was called by God to come out of his homeland, and we looked at that last week. He came out of Ur of the Chaldeans, the ancient predecessors to the Babylonians. So Abraham himself wasn't even an Israelite. He was a Babylonian originally. But he was called to go to this land that God would show him. And God promised Abraham several things when he called him out of this homeland. And we looked at those last week. But it wasn't too long after that that Abraham forgot the promise, promises that God had made him. Because when life got in the way, Abraham forgot. How many of us can relate to that? When life gets in the way, we tend to forget. We tend to forget what God has done for us. But thankfully... God is not hindered by our forgetfulness, nor does he forget his promises that he makes to us so easily. In fact, he makes sure that he won't forget by sealing his covenants to make sure that he would never forget them, even if he could possibly forget them, which he can't. It's not his nature. So what we're going to look at today is how does Abraham's forgetfulness and God's covenant making practices, how do those relate to us today? as people who still deal with short-term memory loss. We still deal with forgetfulness, and we still deal with the forgetfulness when it comes to God and what he has done for us through Jesus on the cross. So if you want to follow along in sermon notes, you can go into your uh, devices and tablets and go to ser.bi, type in Chelmsford Bible Church, and there's some sermon notes there. And also scripture references will be up here on the screens. But the first thing we're going to look at is that we tend to reap the benefits, but forget the mission. We reap the benefits, but forget the mission. If you go to Genesis 12, verses 10 through 20. So this is Genesis 12. We looked at last week with the promises that God made to Abraham. So it's in the same chapter. So it's not long after God made these promises to Abraham that Abraham let life get in the way. And all of a sudden, oops, I forgot what God promised me. So here's what happened. Now there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. It's interesting how God uses famines in Scripture. He uses famines. Famine is just a, a time where there's hardly any food. The famines in the ancient world, especially around the, the time of, especially around the geography of Egypt, 
the Nile River was a big part of agriculture. If the Nile River did not overflow its banks and basically fertilize the soil, get the soil ready to plant, because if the, if the water overflowed its banks, it made the soil very, very good for planting and the harvest would be good that year. If it didn't overflow its banks, there'd be, there'd probably more than likely be a famine in the land because the soil wouldn't be ready to plant. It wouldn't, har wouldn't reap as much. So there was a famine. In verse 11, as he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. Notice how he starts with that, right? Ladies, anytime you're married, you know when your husbands come to you and compliment you, you know we're about to ask you for something. <laughs> that more than likely you're going to say no to, but we're giving it our best go. We're saying, man, you look really pretty today. And then you automatically, you know, if you've been married long enough, what do you want? So he says, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me? He said, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. So as soon as Abram was called by God to journey to the land of Canaan and received promises from God that God would make his name great and all nations would be blessed through him, Abram forgot everything he was just promised. Everything. Remember, God said, whoever blesses you, I will bless, and whoever curses you, I will curse. God was saying, I'm going with you. We looked at that last week. When God was making these promises, he was saying, I'm going too. So Abram quickly forgot that as the famine forced him into Egypt, because Egypt was a place where you get some food, as the famine forced him into Egypt, he forgot that God was going with him too. So there, and we don't know why. Maybe it was a, a cultural thing. You know, in ancient cultures, the gods were bound by geographical lines. So the god of the Egyptian, the gods of the Egyptians couldn't cross the ge geographical lines of Egypt. So maybe Abram was coming from that. Maybe he's coming from that still like culture of Ur, where his, Babylon, his ancient Babylonian gods, his Chaldean gods couldn't cross the border. And maybe he thought, well, this God that called me, maybe he can't cross the border into Egypt. Maybe his power doesn't work there. Whatever it was, Abram quickly forgot that God said, whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you, I will curse. I will go with you. I will be with you. He forgets that. How often do we forget that God goes with us wherever we go? We quickly forget it. But God promised to make Abram into a great nation so that Abram could live a life of privilege. God promised to make Abram into a great nation to carry on the story of the promised seed who would come to redeem mankind. Because remember, ever since the Garden of Eden, God was on a mission of redemption. He always has been. He still is. He's on a mission of redemption. And we've been seeing that as we go through these promises and these different stories where the promises show up. God is narrowing down where that seed is going to come from. So right now we're in the midst of Abram. We know that that seed is going to come from the line of Abram, who would later be called Abraham. So God's not going to just abandon Abraham to the Egyptians and have him killed. Abram doesn't need to go into Egypt and take matters into his own hands, which we know that Abraham had a tendency to do that. If you know the story of Abraham. So when this famine forced Abram and Sarah to Sarai to journey to Egypt, what is interesting is that a famine is usually not a man-made event. It's not like somebody just decided, let's have a famine in the world. Famine is uncontrollable. It's a force of nature. You do not have much control over that. 
But why did this famine happen right after God made these promises to Abram? I think one of the reasons could be that God wanted Abram to understand God's mission in this world. He's pushing Abram to Egypt. He's like, yeah, your, your ancestors are going to inherit the land of Canaan. They're going to live there, which will, is modern day Israel. They're going to be there. But you're not. You're going to be this wanderer and this soldier. So I, what I want you to do is wander into other nations and tell them about the goodness of God. Be on mission. See, Abram was not just sent to go live in a land. He never actually lived in the land of Canaan. God showed it to him and said, you see this land? Your ancestors will have it, but you'll never, you'll never live here. You'll always be a wanderer. And you read that and go, well, that's kind of mean. Why would you call him out of his homeland where he was good, he was comfortable, and take him to a land that he could never go into? Because that wasn't Abram's purpose. That wasn't his mission. His mission was to be a wanderer. His mission was to be a sojourner. His mission was to be a traveler, a nomad for the kingdom of God. He points to another nomad who comes along, who would be the seed of Abraham, known as Jesus. Remember, there are people who came to Jesus and said, hey, let, it, let us go follow you. I want to go follow you, Jesus. And Jesus goes, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. You know, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man, the Son of God, God himself, I don't have anywhere to lay my head. You sure you want to live that life? This is the life you're asking to, to come into. You sure you want that? Jesus was nomad even in his own homeland. He traveled all around because he was on mission for the kingdom of God. Abraham was on mission for the kingdom of God. Just Abraham forgot it. He quickly forgot it. As soon as Abram entered Egypt, he lied to Pharaoh about Sarai. He said that Sarai was his sister. Now, ladies, how would you like your husband to say that about you? You go to a foreign land and say, you know, they're going to think you're beautiful here, so just say you're my sister. Because I don't want to die. <laughs> okay? How would you like it if your husband threw you under the bus like that? I mean, I don't know. I, I'd like to, you know, we don't always get the, the nuances when you read scripture in these stories. I'd like to see Sarai's reaction when Abraham told her that. I'd like to see that maybe look of death on her face, like I'm going to kill you. If Pharaoh doesn't kill you, I'm going to kill you. But that's what he told her. Because Abram was thinking about himself. He wasn't thinking about the mission. He wasn't thinking about protecting his wife, which he kind of follows in the footsteps of Adam, right? Adam just lets the serpent talk to his wife and never says anything. Never says anything. But God intervened because God was more concerned about the mission than about Abraham's selfishness. Abram wanted to reap the benefits of the covenant, but he forgot the mission of the covenant. This seems to be the message of the American church sometimes today. We want the blessings from God, but when it comes to living out the mission of God, we're like, we start making excuses. I don't know if I can do that. That really doesn't fit in my lifestyle. That doesn't fit in my routine. I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can just really put that in. I just, I really have a busy schedule, God. You know my schedule, Lord. I pray about it every day. I just don't have any more time. But yet we go to God and say, can you give us this today? Can you give us that today? Can you give us this? But yet when God says, yes, I'll give you that for the mission. I don't know. That's a, that's a lot. That's a lot to ask, Lord. That is a lot to ask. I don't know if I can do that. You see, God has always been about reaching the nations with his message. He's always been about furthering his kingdom, spreading his kingdom to all the nations. If you look at Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 23, this is what is said in Ezekiel. And this Ezekiel prophesies during the time when the southern kingdom of Judah is being taken into captivity of Babylon. And you've got Jews there who are like, I, what are we going to do? We have to go into this Babylonian nation. We don't know that culture. We don't believe in their gods. We don't believe in their practices. We don't believe in anything that they do. And Ezekiel is called to, to preach to them, to speak to them, to prophesy to them. 
And this is what Ezekiel, this is what God says to the prophet Ezekiel in verse 23 of chapter 38. And so I will show my greatness. This is God speaking. And my holiness. And I will make myself known in the sight of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord. See, even in the midst of exile, when the, when the Israelites are being punished for forgetting God, for forgetting his promises, for forgetting his covenant, and they're brought into these foreign lands, God says, I want you to go. I want you to go into those foreign lands. And I want you to build lives, build homes, pray for the peace of the city. I want the cities you're going into to be blessed so that they may know me. If you look at Romans chapter 16, verses 25 through 26, this is what Paul says to the Roman church. And, you know, the Roman church is in the midst of the Roman Empire. And this is what Paul says to them. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. This is like this doxology. It's like his ending. He's ending this letter, and he's saying, look, here is the mystery that is revealed, that all people everywhere may know Jesus. That's the great mystery that's been revealed, and that's always been God's heart. The mission of God has always been to spread his gospel to the nations. Because when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, they were put on a mission. They were put on a journey. And we've been on that journey ever since. God did not kick them out of the garden just to punish them. God kicked them out of the garden to say, hey, I'm putting you on a journey. And as you're living, as you're going, I want you to tell everybody you know about me. I want you to tell everybody you know about the seed that I promised. The seed that would come to destroy the forces of evil. The seed that would come to destroy sin and death. Yeah, I know you, you disobeyed. You ate from the tree I told you not to eat from. But that's okay. I'm going to fix that. But as you're living life, as you wait for that day where I'm going to fix it, I want you to tell everybody about me. So when Abram lied to Pharaoh, he put the mission at risk. And that's why God intervened. See, God... God was concerned about Abraham, yes. He was concerned about Sarah, yes. But he's more concerned about the mission. God intervened because he was not going to let his mission be thwarted by human selfishness. And he never will. He never will. Even if you look at the cross of Jesus, the Jews showed lots of human selfishness. This rabbi, who's this rabbi that's taking all of our attention away? We are the religious leaders. We know who God is. We know how to teach about God. This guy doesn't. He's from Nazareth. Nothing good come from Nazareth. He's a carpenter's son. What does he know? He's taking all the attention away. The pilot goes, what do you want me to do with him? Crucify him. Get rid of him. Because it's all about us. Not about him. You see, God intervened. They just didn't realize it was God who intervened. Jesus willingly went to the cross. He willingly submitted to human selfishness to combat human selfishness, to remind us of the goodness of God. You see, God wants to bless us, but he wants, us, wants to bless us in light of the ongoing mission of the gospel. God does not bless us because he wants us to live a life of privilege. God is about his glory and his gospel because his gospel is good news for everyone. Everyone. When we just focus on the blessings of God and think they are for our individual benefits only, then we are missing the point of God's blessing. Now, does God bless us because he loves us as a loving father and he wants to bless us just because? Absolutely. Absolutely he does. But any, when any time those blessings come, we need to say, all right, God, what do you want me to do with this? And he may say, hey, I just want you to take, I just want to take care of your family right now. I just want to take care of you right now. But he may also say, but he may say at other times, I need you to help them. I need you to go here. I need you to do this. You know that extra 
money I gave you. You know that, that tax return I gave you and you didn't expect that big of a tax return? This is what I want you to do with it. I want you to help those. I want you to help those people. I want you to give here. I want you to do this. We have to be willing when we get and receive that blessing from God to say, God, what do you want me to do? Because if we just say, thanks, God, appreciate it, we'll see you later, we'll see you on Sunday, that's forgetting the mission. That's just reaping the benefits, but forgetting the mission. Because we are like Abraham. Whether we want to admit it or not, we are much like Abraham. This world is not our home. We are wanderers, we are sojourners, we are travelers. We're just passing through. And as we're passing through, what did Jesus tell his disciples before he ascended into heaven? Go and make disciples. That word go, as you're going, as you're living life, make disciples. We can't forget the mission. And the reason we can't forget the mission leads to the second point I want to talk about this morning is that God takes covenants seriously. God takes his promises, his covenants very seriously. You go to Genesis 15. So we're going to fast forward a little bit. We don't know necessarily how long it's been since Genesis 12. But Genesis 15 comes along and Abraham knows and he understands the covenant that God has made with him. And he's getting a little frustrated because he's like, wait a minute, I, I'm getting old. I'm getting old here, God. I got a lot of wrinkles. And it hurts to get out of bed in the mornings. I have to grunt when I sit down. You know, the old man grunt when you sit down in a chair, you go, Ugh. Then when you get up, Ugh, you know, that, that kind of thing. It's like you're lifting 500 pounds. You know, we all do that. Maybe it's just guys. I don't know if ladies do that. But Abram's looking at, and my wife, look at her. Look how old she is. You know, Abraham's never really helping himself here. <laughs> but here's in Genesis 15, starting in verse 1, and we're going to read down through verse 12. It says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram, Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and, his, and it, he credited to him his righteousness. He also said to him, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. Notice how God addresses that short-term memory. I'm the God who brought you out of Ur. Remember that, Abram. Remember. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. I'll we'll read a few more verses. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. That's what we read about in the Exodus. God was prophesying what was going to happen. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried in a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants, I give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Kadamonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. So this is what's going on. 
Notice how God starts off by reminding Abraham that he is Abram's shield and his very great reward. He wants him to remember, remember, you don't need all this, you don't need this stuff. You don't need this stuff that you see in this world. You don't need all this stuff that you can't even take with you. This temporary stuff. Remember that I am your great reward. Like I said, Abram's discouraged and he's stressed because he's looking going, I got a servant in my house who's going to be my inheritor. He's the one that I'm giving all my stuff to because I don't have any kids. God, what's going on? You promised me these things. What is going on? We're not getting any younger here. Can you help a brother out? But God reaffirmed the promise to Abram to give him an heir. But he didn't stop there. He promised to give him so many descendants that he would not be able to count them. Not be able to count them. And here's the crazy part of this. Here's how this relates to us. When God was saying, I'll give you so many descendants that, you, that if you want to try to count the stars, go ahead because you probably can't. Because you ever try to count the stars? It takes you about two seconds to forget which star you just counted because they're all right next to each other. So Abram is like, God is like, if you want to count the stars, go ahead. That's how many your descendants will be. And here's how that relates to us. God wasn't necessarily talking about his physical descendants. Remember what God promised Abraham? I will make you into a great nation. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And Paul wrote in his letters and he says, look, here's the deal. You want to be part of God's family? Then be like Abraham, who believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. And you can be sons of Abraham and daughters of Abraham. So when Abram believed that what God had told him, God wasn't done yet. God wanted to really reaffirm this covenant and he wanted to show Abram, this is how serious I take covenants. So God told Abram to take a heifer, a goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. All of these later, when you get to the tabernacle, the tabernacle was the temporary uh, tent that they used for the temple. The temple would come later. And all of these animals were used in the different sacrifices at the temple or the tabernacle, depending on how much money you had. You know, if you brought a heifer, you'd be probably well off. If you could only bring pigeons or turtle doves, not so much. Guess what Mary and Joseph brought when they first brought Jesus to the temple? Doves. Brought doves, because they weren't so well off. Jesus was born in poverty to make us rich. But here's what happened. God told him, Abram, I want you to take these animals. And Abram took them and he cut them in half. This is a crazy, bloody story. You know, you see this in a movie. It's probably like parental guidance is strongly suggested. So he cut these animals in half and puts them on each side of this path. Now you're thinking, why in the world are you doing this? This is gross. Because that's how... In ancient times, if kings were making covenants with each other, promises with each other, agreements, peace treaties, these kings would have these animals, an animal cut in two. And each party involved in the covenant or the treaty would pass through the animal halves. And by doing that, they were saying, may the same thing be done to me if I break this covenant, if I break this promise. So God is saying, this is how serious I'm taking this covenant, Abram. Cut the animals in half. We're going to do this. But here's the crazy part of the story. God and Abram and all of Abram's descendants are entering into this covenant. But God is the only one that's going to keep it. And before Abram could do anything else, once he prepared the animals, God put him to sleep. God was the first anesthesiologist. Put him to sleep. Now, why would he put Abram to sleep? Because God did not want Abram to pass through those animal halves. Because he knew Abram and all of his descendants, all of us after him, you can't keep this covenant. You can't bear that burden. You cannot bear the responsibility of passing through these animal halves because it'll take two seconds before you're supposed to be cut in half. Because you'll break it. 
And when Abram saw in this vision, this dream, the smoking fire pot, this flaming thing pass through these animal halves, that was God passing through. And God was saying, I'll take the responsibility. I'll take the burden. Remember when we looked at Noah, and I said the some commentators, some scholars think that the rainbow is the sign of the covenant because God was laying down his bow because he was done shooting the arrow on the earth. He said, I'm not going to shoot any more arrows on the earth. I'm going to lay down my bow so that the arrow is pointing back at me. And if I break this covenant, if I break my promise, if I send a flood to destroy the earth again, may the arrow be shot at me. And God is saying, if I break this covenant, Abram, May I be cut in two. May I be cut in two. You see, God knew that beforehand he wanted to keep Abram from passing through the animal halves. God was willing to take on the covenant responsibilities and even the covenant curses upon himself. Because he knew that both responsibilities and the curses were too much for Abram and all of his descendants to bear. If God wanted us to bear these responsibilities, he would have never sent Jesus. He said, you guys got the law. You better keep it or else you're going to be cut in two. Good luck. That's not how God works. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9, this is what Paul writes to the Galatian church. And, and Paul uses the story of Abraham to explain the gospel truth to them. And he says this. So also Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Notice it says faith. Has nothing to do with blood. Has nothing to do with your genetics. Has nothing to do with your DNA. He says all those who have faith are children of Abraham. Because these Gentiles, these Galatians had heard from Jews probably their whole life. You'll never be welcomed into the family of God. You'll never be sons of Abraham and daughters of Abraham. We are. Because we have his blood running through our veins. And Paul comes in and says, no, they're wrong. They're wrong. It's those who have faith like Abraham. Verse 8, Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. You see, these Galatians were being told by some Jews, you have to be circumcised in order to believe in Jesus. You have to be circumcised in order to be part of the family of God, to be part of the kingdom of God, to be part of the people of God. You have to go through that physical act. And Paul wrote to them and says, who told you that? Who confused you? Who got you off the wrong path? Because whoever told you that is wrong. Because here's the thing. God made the promises to Abraham before he told them, told Abraham to be circumcised. The promises God made to Abraham came before the act. God just told him to do that as a sign of the covenant. Because if you look at Genesis 12 through 15, you don't see any circumcision mentioned. But if you get to Genesis 17, that's where it comes in. If you look at Galatians 3, 13 through 14, just skipping down a few verses. This is what Paul says to the Galatians. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. He says, you want to be part of the family of God? You want to be part of the people of God? Believe in Jesus through faith. That's it. Put your faith in Christ and you are part of the family of God. Jesus is the same God who passed through the animal halves. He's the same one. He passed through those animal halves pointing to what he would do for us on the cross. Where his blood would be drained completely from his body and he would be dead. Taking upon him the curse of the covenants. Jesus died on the cross as, in, as an innocent man, innocent of breaking the covenants, but yet he took on the curse for us. And he says, I will take on the curse of the covenants for them. I know they broke it. 
But I'll tell you, I'll die for him. I'll take the punishment for him as though I did. Because of all this, all who believe in Jesus are set free from the curse of the law and made alive in Christ. The curse of the law brought death because the law defines sin and sin brings death. But the cross brings life through the one who was cursed upon it. <clears throat> Jesus came to show us just how seriously God takes his covenants. He takes them so seriously that God was willing to do anything. And when God passed through those, those halves that, that Abraham prepared, he was pointing to how far he was willing to go. He was saying, I'm willing to die. I'm willing to die. If you break these covenants, which you will, I'm willing to die for you. I'm willing to die and take that curse, the covenants upon myself. He was pointing to Jesus. He was pointing to the seed that would come from Abraham. See, God was willing to send his son to seal the covenant promise forever. He was willing to be cursed so that we wouldn't have to be. So in closing... Let us not just reap the benefits of the covenant and forget the mission. We're, we're always going to suffer from short-term memory loss. We always will. But let us look to God and say, God, how can I be on mission for you today? And know how seriously God takes the covenants. God was willing to take upon himself the curse of the covenants so that we wouldn't have to. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.